Today, we're going to be diving into the fourth of our seven values as a local community. And this value is empowering believers for everyday mission. And this value perhaps could be summarized by the John Wimber quote. The church is not a building. It's the people. It's not just the gathering. It's also the scattering. And for those who don't know who John Wimber was, he was initially a Quaker who later became a leader in the so-called third wave charismatic renewal and was the leader of the vineyard churches. And this idea, however, that the, the church is not the building, it's the people and it's not just the scatter, the gathering, but also the scattering. It, it's an old one. And we are gathered on a Sunday to offer thanksgiving to God and also to receive from him, whether through the word or, or through the bread and the wine. And then we're sent out as scattered servants throughout the week in order to gather together then again on the following Sunday. And if anyone's ever attended a Church of England service, you might have noticed that the vicar ends the service with the words, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And since 2008, one of the dismissal options for priests when they're planning their services in the Roman Catholic Church is go and announce the gospel of the Lord. And in both liturgies, the idea is present that the, the gathered saints are being scattered for a purpose, to love and serve God, to announce the gospel. And those parting words are a reminder week after week that you've got work to do. Uh, you're being sent on a mission. And in Luke chapter 10, verses 1 to 9, Jesus sends out the 70 or the 72 disciples, depending on the manuscript. And Jesus gives these disciples different instructions than he gave the 12 apostles when he sent them out. And as many of you are aware, numbers are highly symbolic in the Bible and they often carry hidden meanings. The most obvious is 666 in the book of Revelation. In John 22, chapter 22, verse 11, uh, just after the resurrection, Jesus meets the disciples fishing and he tells them where to cast their nets, nets and they catch 153 fish. And 153 carries the symbolic number of sons of God. And so John is saying that Christ is making them fishers of men. It's symbolic value here. They're not just fishermen, they're also fishers of men. They're catching sons of God for the kingdom. Um, 70 or 72 carries the symbolic number of the Gentiles and the Gentile nations from the list in Genesis of the 70 nations or 72 nations. And it's also Israel had 70, el 70 elders or 72 elders so they could be a nation of priests to the nations. And when the Jewish scribes translated the Bible into Greek, there were 70 of them. So it's called the Septuagint because it's a, the version for the nations. It's the scriptures being for the nations now. And uh, 72 as well is divided by six is 12 as there are 12 tribes of Israel. And so in Luke chapter 10, verses one to nine, Jesus has chosen these disciples and he sends them out symbolically for the nations and we read after this the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them out ahead of him two by two into every town and place where he himself was to go and he said to them the harvest is plentiful but the workers are few therefore ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest go I'm sending you out like lambs surrounded by wolves do not carry a money bag, a traveller's bag, sandals, and greet no one on the road. Wherever you enter a house, first say, may the peace be on this house. And if a peace-loving person is there, your peace will remain on him. But if not, it will return to you. Stay in that same house, eating and drinking what they give you. For the worker deserves his pay. Do not move around from house to house. Um, whenever you enter a town, the people welcome you. Eat what is set before you. Heal the sick in that town and say to them, the kingdom of God has come upon you. 
uh, Phil Wilthrow in his book Multiplying Disciples uses an acronym gospel to draw out some guidance from this passage. And I'm just going to use his acronym because it's fairly helpful. The first letter G is God is on the move. And we read in verse one, after this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them ahead of them two by two into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And friends, we're to go. We've been sent out on a mission. The Chinese churchman Watchman Nee said, I do not con consecrate myself to be a missionary or a preacher. Rather, I consecrate myself to God to do his will where I am, be it in the school or office or kitchen, wherever he may, in his window, wisdom, send me. That's brilliant, isn't it? That we're called to be used for his purposes, wherever we may find ourselves, wherever we find ourselves during the week. As we scatter from our Sunday gatherings with a mission, we point people always to Jesus. The second letter O is obedience is success. In verse two, we read, he himself said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Therefore, go. Our success, friends, is based not upon what we're achieving, but simply upon our obedience to go. It's about to be about our father's business. Friends, it's the Holy Spirit who brings the conviction of, to the world, not us. Uh, we can be obedient in speaking about Jesus, but we can't change people's hearts. That's God's job. And often people harden their hearts, even as he's knocking on the door to come in. But we can also pray to the Lord of the harvest to bring in those more workers. And as it is our harvest collection today, uh, it's all the more fitting that we should acknowledge Jesus Christ is the Lord of the harvest. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 6 through to 8, Paul writes, I planted, Apollos watered, but God caused it to grow. So neither the one who plants counts for anything, nor the one who waters, but God who causes the growth. The one who plants and the one who waters work as one, and each will receive the war reward according to his work. So friends, we are going to be rewarded for our work, but what matters is God. He's the one who causes the growth. And without him, we've got nothing. The third letter is S, and it's show courage. Verse three, go, I'm sending you like lambs surrounded by wolves. And in 2 Corinthians chapter two, uh, verses 15 to 16, Paul writes, for we are to God a sweet fragrance of Christ among those who are saved and among those who are perished. The one we are a fragrance of death, which brings death and to others, the fragrance of life, which brings life. I find it so interesting that the same smell to one is a delicious smell and to others it's a, a smell of death. And there will be those who oppose our message. But let us always be opposed for the right reasons, for our hope in the resurrection of the Messiah, not because we've got a certain political agenda or something. And the fourth letter is P, partner with people of peace. Verses six five and six read this whenever you enter a house first say may peace be on this house and we're called to invest our time in people people looking for shalom looking for the peace of god and paul in first thessalonians chapter 2 verse 8 says because we loved you so much we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of god but the lives our lives as well and what friends when people are dear to us we want to share our lives with them and in doing so we will also share the gospel as people get to know you uh, they will also get to know the one that you love and this is if you truly love God in the words of A.W. Tozer what's closest to your heart you will talk about and if God is closest to your heart then you will talk about him Friends, the biggest hindrance in our evangelism is that we don't actually love God, uh, nor do we want to tell others about him. For if we do love him, then we'll be unable not to talk about him.
it just come from us it will flow out of us we will just want to talk about him all the time the fifth letter is e and it's expect god's power and presence verses eight and nine whenever you enter a town and people welcome you eat what is set before you heal the sick in that town and say to them the kingdom of god has come upon you jesus encourages his disciples to eat with those who offered hospitality and to heal the sick in the town friends part of our calling therefore is to push doors, to see where they open and to, to go through, to eat with those who are happy to eat with us and point people ever towards Jesus, who is the great physician of our souls. Yes, there's a place for physical healing. Of course there is. We should pray for those who need healing. But the most important healing that any of us need is the healing of our relationship with God. For that one has eternal consequences. As everyday missionaries, we're called to meet people wherever they are and to simply be Jesus to them. Teresa of Avila, a Spanish writer on the spiritual life, said, Christ has no body on earth but yours, no hands, no feet but yours. Yours are the eyes with which Christ looks out with compassion on the world. Yours are the feet with which he is to go about doing good. And yours are the hands with which he blesses us now. It's an important thought to grasp, one that Paul really took hold of following his call to preach to the nations, the Gentiles, on the, the road to Damascus. The risen Christ told him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He was persecuting Christians, but Christ so identifies with us that he says, why do you persecute me? The Christian is part of Christ's body in the world. The last letter, L, of gospel is lead people to Jesus. And that is what being an everyday missionary is all about. We're beggars telling beggars where to find the bread. We don't have it all together, but we're saying Christ is the way. He's the truth. He's the life. He's where we get the bread of heaven from. He's the bread that feeds our souls. That is the source of life. Uh, General William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, said, You cannot warm the hearts of people with God's love if they've got an empty stomach and cold feet. And it's often the case that our words and our actions must go together. In 1 Peter 3.15, Peter writes, Always be prepared to answer to anyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Friends, we must always be prepared to be in that state of readiness to give an answer that anyone might ask of why our hope is in Jesus the Messiah. However, any answers must we give will be with gentleness and respect. And since we're going to be celebrating the harvest today, it seems that we should mention our Lord's parable of the sower from Matthew 13, 1 to 23. We're told in verses 3 to 9. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he scattered the seed, some fell along the path and the birds came and they ate it up. Some fell on rocky places and it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still others fell on the good soil, where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty or thirty times that was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. And Jesus explains this to us in 19 to 23, when we read, When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes, snatches away what was sown in their heart. And this is a seed sown along the path. The seed falling on the ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. And when trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they fall asleep. Um, 
So one who hears the word weren't making it unfruitful. Sorry, I've just lost my place. Since I'll go back to verse 21. And since they have no root, it lasts only a short time. When trouble or persecution because of the word, it fall, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on the good soil refers to someone who hears the word and they understands it. And this is the one who produces a crop, yielding a hundred, sixty or thirty times what was sown. And this parable explains for us many of our own experiences with people we know and people we speak to about faith. Number one, the, there would be a group of people, number one, who some just do not understand our message and Satan has blinded the, their eyes to the truth. Number two, some re receive the message very enthusiastically, but then something bad happens and they walk away. Number three, some re receive the message, but then the worries of this life, the things of this world, desires for wealth, they make them unfruitful. And number four, some receive the message and understand it, but go on to yield a great crop. I think we all know these four kinds of people and we should not be surprised when some do walk away because Jesus has said that they would. And what we need to do is encourage the seeds, uh, the good seeds, the fallen in good soil, but also the seeds among the thorns to break free from their thorns so they can go on to produce good fruit. The worries of this life, the desires for political power, whatever it might be, are ways in which our fruitfulness can get choked by the weeds. In Matthew 16, 41 to 43, Jesus describes the end of this age and he says this, The Son of Man will send out his angels, they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace, where there will be weeping and the gnashing of teeth. And the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. This is a warning for all of us. When Christ returns at the end of the harvest, will he and the angels remove us? Will they? Will they remove us? Or will we have a place in the kingdom and shine like the sun? Do we have ears to hear? It's an important message for all of us to grasp. In Acts 10, 30 4 to 35, Peter declares, Now I realise how true it is. God does not show favouritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. Friends, this is all that's asked from us, that we turn from our idols and we turn to the God of Israel, that we turn away from sin and that we're united with Jesus the Messiah through the waters of baptism. Jesus as the Messiah of Israel has made a way for us to be acceptable to God, not because of our many works, but because of our faith in him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our wrongdoings from us. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, God has made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, that in him we would become the righteousness of of God. So friends, as long as we're in the Messiah, in Christ Jesus, as long as we're united with him, then we have the righteousness of God, that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And friends, as we dwell upon the subject of empowering believers for everyday mission, let us be assured that it is the Holy Spirit who empowers any of us for mission. God is the one who brings the harvest, not us. So in conclusion, friends, as we are gathered on a Sunday to offer thanksgiving to God and to receive from him, then let us be scattered servants throughout this week and every week to gather together again on the following Sunday. It is the Lord who's in charge of the harvest, not us, but we're called to be faithful and fruitful servants. So this week, let us seek God for his empowerment through the spirit for our mission and for his presence to be in our lives. Amen. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we just pray that for each of us this week, that we might have your presence, your power through your spirit, that we might be your scattered servants this week, wherever we go. Amen.